So, we're delighted, I'm Chris Jury, uh, from the Chamber. It's my pleasure to welcome you here. Um, first off, let's have a round of applause for Chef Charles Herman and his wow. crew. Charles operates the kitchen at the Teen Challenge Center, uh, where we have our annual meeting last year and this year, and his whole crew puts this together. Charles is a, a graduate of the uh, Culinary Institute of America and has uh, on his own contract at the facilities in the next three years. So uh, thank you again, Charles. <laughs> So good morning, afternoon, or it's afternoon now at this point. I'm Chris Cooney. It's my pleasure to welcome you here uh, to the world headquarters of Holy Cross Family Ministries. Uh, this is their newest edition. Uh, it's the Museum of Family Prayer at the Father Payton Center. Uh, we will hear a lot more about Father Payton, uh, his role, uh, his rise towards sainthood, and this extraordinary facility in a few moments uh, when our host is interviewed. Uh, there will also be tours after this lunch concludes. The museum is just next door. This is part of the facility, but the museum itself is pretty interactive and pretty interesting, uh, just on the other side of the walls here. In addition, we will hear from our sponsor today, Rockland Trust Company, and we have a very positive seg segment on networking uh, with our speaker, John Wilson, from uh, Prospecting Intel, and we'll look forward to that. I'd like to remind you uh, to make sure that you have your business cards in the basket. We have a front desk, but they're going to send it around. There are a couple of great door prizes. If you haven't gotten your uh, business card in the basket, please do so. Uh, and we'll be around uh, now to make sure you get them in there. It's now my, in, in, uh, my pleasure to introduce our MC today, a man who has had a long career and is widely known not as a saint. Uh, but as a <laughs> singular force for good in the region. And uh, he also celebrates his birthday and his retirement uh, next week on November 1st, which happens to be All Saints Day. Please oh, wow. everybody welcome to the game. Hey, my daughter, too. Uh, large family and we worked together for so many years on the chamber and Chris, I'm not sure how you escaped not having your mother commit you to become a priest. So, um, first, if I could give a shout out to our ambassadors, if you could stand up and give a wave, uh, Joanne Schneider from Eastern Bank. Bridgewater Savings Bank. She just texted me. From Crescent Credit Union. Susan <laughs> from Mansfield Bank. <laughs> I think we're well banked here today. Right. Uh, Paul Key from Massachusetts Community College. <laughs> Cheryl Miller from uh, Legal Shield. Steve Damon from Jack Conway. So uh, I'm very honored to be here. And uh, one of the things, Chris sent me a text message uh, on Tuesday. I was in Cooperstown and said, Ray, I think uh, you're uniquely qualified uh, for this event coming up. Would you please be willing to host uh, the or MC the event here uh, today? And I said, well, Chris and I have known each other for quite some time. And I said, well, he really does know me. He must be asking me to host because he knows I went to parochial school. I was in the boys' choir. My parents worked for the bishop here in the diocese and taught pre caner and had been to a number of retreats. And I was born on All Saints Day. So I thought Chris was kind of saying, geez, I know you, to, you know, and uh, I go to the same parish as uh, Rand Dillon. So I said, well, thank you very much, Chris. And I said, these are the reasons why. And he said, yeah, those two, but Fran Dillon, our normal speaker at MC, is away today. Uh, it's here at Cooperstown. You understand the meaning of the kitchen. So that's uh, true. Uh, so, so, and then uh, I always have a special relationship here with Stonehill College. And I used to kid Fran Dillon for years because my wife's great uncle, uh, was uh, the president here, Father Duffy, and I always kid Fran about Father Duffy used to tell my father-in-law that 
his children and grandchildren would go to school here for free. And, but that never occurred, but I said that story to a Father Mark Cregan once. And Father Mark and I had a special relationship because I worked my way through school being a bus driver. And Father Mark, was, uh, who was the president here, was also a, drove a bus in Brooklyn. So Father Mark asked me uh, here for lunch, and he had something on his mind. And he said, now, Ray, um, you know, I drove a bus, and I don't see any buses here coming through campus on a regular basis. Uh, what do you think about bringing some buses here uh, to campus on a regular basis? And I said, geez, um, that's a good idea, Father Mark. I noticed you have some beautiful tennis courts here. And my friends and I play tennis in the summer, but we're really looking for a place to play tennis at night. Any chance you could put the lights on at night for us? And he said, sure. So for several years, he would turn the lights on at night for us. The police officer would come at about 7 o'clock and turn the lights on for us at night. But I want to assure you that that relationship, in that relationship, there was absolutely no quid pro quo. <laughs> I can't walk back any of these comments at this point. So it's, it's, it's my honor to introduce uh, today and speak about a very, very fine financial institution. We have a number of fine financial institutions here today. And today's sponsor is Rockland Trust Company. At Rockland Trust, the relationships they have with their customers is important to them. With more than a 110-year heritage of building long-term relationships, their team of knowledgeable professionals strive to live up to their promise of where each relationship matters. They make decisions locally with a real understanding of their customers' needs. With over 95 branches located throughout eastern Massachusetts, Rockland Trust has the perfect combination of resources and convenience for everyone. Please help me in welcoming Rockland Trust Company's Commercial Relationship Manager, Grant Nickerson, who will be interviewed by Marsa Kanabi, uh, Kanabi uh, from Kanabi Immigration Law. Marsa. surprises, but sometimes surprises happen, and so what are some of the things that business owners are caught off guard with when applying for a loan, and does it doesn't have to do with certain paperwork or, um, you know, the timeline? Tell us a little bit about that. Okay, well, um, not so much the paperwork uh, that's required, but, uh, and, and the timeline varies depending on the type of loan, um, you know, just a little simple line of credit with one empty you can turn one of those around pretty quick, but it's a big construction project with uh, multiple guarantors and multiple borrowers and <laughs> could get uh, a little more complicated. But um, I think two things that catch people off guard is, uh, one, if there's real estate involved, the level of environmental due diligence that's required <clears throat> or requested um, by the bank, uh, that can uh, catch folks off guard because those type of... Uh, studies and digging and drilling and sampling can be pretty pricey. The second thing that catches, catches people off guard is um, the questions that the bankers ask sometimes. Um, things like, what happens if you're, you kick the bucket? <laughs> now that's not the most artful way of asking that question. We usually don't ask that way, but those type of ideas. You know, the, there's a downturn coming eventually, you know, what do you plan to do about that? And, um, you know, there's, there's an art to ask these questions <clears throat> to not sound accusatory. Um, some are better than others at that, um, but uh, it's not a, a, intended to, as a, like a gotcha uh, uh, attack. Uh, it's really we're looking for two things: we're looking for either an answer that really makes us feel more comfortable uh, in, in the planning that, that the business owner has, has done, uh, or B, it's intended to get the business owner to sort of think about. Uh, these type of things, and, and from from other you know aspects, uh, we think about them because we see things go sideways sometimes over over time and the end of economic cycles, and so um, um, we just like to try and get our, our customers to to think along those lines sometimes. Hey, 
well, it's, it sounds like a really nice way to get people to think ahead if they haven't and make sure they talk to a trust and estate attorney in case they haven't. Um, so, and I'm not a trust and estate attorney, so I have business for myself. Um, so now rates have started to, to decrease a little bit. And so what does that mean for you? And what should business owners, again, be preparing for? Okay, well, um, the lower rates uh, influence cap rates, which uh, which uh, the lower the cap rate, the higher these appraisals are coming in at, the higher valuations. Um, so a lot of folks like to take this opportunity to take advantage of the lower rate environment, refinance. Thanks. Uh, refinance their, their debt, pull some cash out, uh, which makes a lot of sense. But we, um, the bank recognizes that we're pretty far along in the cycle, and you can make a loan on these really favorable terms. And um, five years from now, at the end of the, the term, you know, if we're, things go sideways again, and you could find you're your underwater. Uh, and in, instead of uh, uh, just renewing again, you might have to write a check to, to get the balance down to get the LTV low. So, what the borrowers might want to be prepared for is the bank to um, not want to advance as much as they want to take out. Um, and, but again, it's it's the eye toward the future and uh, preparing for for that inevitable downturn. <clears throat> Well, Chris and his staff tell me that you have a crystal ball somewhere. <laughs> and so what would be your piece of advice for businesses looking ahead to 2020? Right. Um, don't be offended by the questions that your banker asks you. Uh, and, um, you know, things are going really well for, for most folks and uh, most businesses now. And so maybe now is a good time to uh, sit down with a banker and have an a open conversation about uh, think about some of those aspects that maybe you don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Succession planning um, in the near term, uh, fraud protection, or, or you know, do you have tools in place to prevent fraud uh, from occurring? That happens a lot nowadays. Um, you know, thinking about uh, uh, the business continuity and uh, so on and so forth. So you know, sit down with the banker. You know, just open it up for discussion. And so lastly, um, you're not going out as a banker for trick-or-treating, are you? What's your question? Uh, well, uh, the, uh, number five is my uh, favorite number. Abe Lincoln is on the $5 bill. Uh, also, uh, he's on the penny, and I'm a notorious penny pitcher, so I'm going to take <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. If you uh, you can't miss it, but sitting at your table, we will have something given to you by Rockland Trust. I think there's a pen there as well. But my last straw. I spent a lot of thought on marketing over there. So very environmentally uh, conscious. I will be a winner when I go home tonight. So uh, thank you. So it, it's. Uh, I'd like to next. Uh, it, like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Susan Wallace. Uh, she's from the Museum of Family Prayer, where we are here today. Uh, Susan is the director of external relations for Holy Cross Family Ministries <coughs> and all its global ministries, with 26 offices in 17 countries. The mission continues the vision of sainthood candidate Father Patrick Payton to, <coughs> to help families pray together every day, fulfilling his famous message. The family that prays together stays together. Please welcome Director of External Relations, Susan Wallace, who will be again interviewed by Marcy. Thank you. Thanks, it's great to be here. Susan, thank you so much for hosting us here today. I've had the opportunity to have a tour, and it's truly a beautiful place, and I'm hopeful that community members will be able to use this as a fantastic resource. So could you tell us a little bit about why was the museum built? Well, I'm sure, can, can, is this working? Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, I'm sure your family is like my family. Um, one, we don't have a lot of time to pray. Um, and two, we maybe don't know how to pray as a family. Most people um, know how to pray individually. We did, a, a, we did a research project a few years ago through Georgetown University's research division. It was a national study 
because we didn't know where families were at. So we asked them um, kind of the basic demographic issues. We asked them how they use media, how they pray, how they don't pray, why don't they pray. A lot of great, meaningful questions for us. And like most families, it's probably only 3% that are like doing it all right. And that's just not reality for anyone, really, to expect that of people. And it's wonderful that some do. So we want to address my family, all of your families, and most of them told us, 76%, um, that they pray, but they don't know how to pray as a family. They don't pray as a family. Probably like 7%, I think it was. So we want to help them pray as a family. But then when you look at today, without time, and everybody's digital, so that's where we are. We're in the digital world, and we're meeting people in unexpected ways. And one of the unexpected ways is to have a fun experience in a museum about prayer, about the founder of our ministry, who's a great example and model of prayer. So it's kind of unique, unexpected, and meeting people where they are in a fun way. Prayer should be beautiful and fun and uplifting, not obligatory and responsibility. So that's how we, that's why we built the museum. Oh, thank you. And so besides, for example, helping families understand how to pray together, what other kinds of services will the museum be offering? Well, as was mentioned, we um, have uh, 26 offices in 17 countries. So we're meeting a lot of cultures, a lot of different things. We have, uh, right now, we do things in four languages in a great cross-section, and then we have many other languages that we do culturally and locally, Swahili in one of our offices in Africa. So mostly what we're doing is digital. We have, you'll see some short six minute videos. <coughs> People don't want a lot of time. We have a whole web series. We have two YouTube channels. And we have a whole series of six minute videos on YouTube that people can understand topics. You know, why do bad things happen to good people? Um, what is baptism all about? Someone's baptizing a child. Um, you know, these are a lot of things I honestly didn't know until I started teaching religious ed. I had to teach myself before I could teach others. So we're trying to help people and do gentle faith formation. We have um, 1.5 million people on one of our Facebook pages. And so that, there are corporations that don't have that. We're very proud of it. We work hard for it. But it's basically people have a great longing. Um, they want to feel the peace that comes from prayer. And so that's what we're nurturing. We've had nearly 2 million downloads of just one of our apps. We have about three different apps. And we just, with the opening of the museum, launched another new app. So we're meeting people where they are in many different ways. So we have probably about 25 different social media platforms uh, that we're attending to every day to just keep feeding people gently and kindly and meeting them where they are. And so we're fortunate to live in a, a diverse community. We have people of all different backgrounds. I'm Muslim myself, for example, and as I came into the museum, I saw that you had an exhibit related to the Kaaba in Mecca and things related to Judaism. So obviously, I don't think the museum is meant to just be for Catholics. Could you tell us a little bit about that? We are Catholic. We are a Catholic ministry. Um, we are very proud of our, our founder, Father Patrick Payton, who worked with people of all different faiths. We had a judge on our board, uh, a woman who was Jewish from um, Brazil on our board for many years. So he worked with many different people of many different faiths. Um, our greatest gift from God or from our supreme being um, is, our, is our faith in our family. And Father Peyton attended to that, and we try and do that today. Um, we, we want, um, Pope Francis says, one of his latest quotes was, the family is God's masterpiece. And isn't that how we feel about our family? And we want to nurture them and attend to them. That's all families. We welcome all families, all faiths, whatever it be, and that's why the rotunda was built the way it was, very deliberately. We hope everyone that walks in, I honestly, I'm, I'm divorced mother of one. So, I kind of don't fit in the norm for the Catholic Church for that little 3% of the pew, so that's my goal. I got my divorced friends. Yes, you should be practicing the faith. And so we want to welcome everyone. And we hope that Rotunda did that for you, and I'm so glad it did for you. It's beautiful, isn't it? It is. Thank, Thank you. you. And so tell us, what is the cause for canonization, and when will Father Payton become a saint? This always gets a lot of press, let me tell you. I love, I, I obviously marketing and PR for the organization, and I love sending something out. People are fascinated with the cause process. So basically, because it, it's like an hour-long lecture, and I had to learn so much about it when I came here, I didn't really know anything about it, except some people are saints, and who's the patron of cancer, and those types of things. But 
As Catholics, we believe we are all part of the communion of saints. But the Catholic Church, even our M saint, you're a saint. <laughs> but the Catholic Church wants to um, formalize the process. So if we're going to really encourage people to follow a particular person, we'd like to know that they had heroic, holy virtue. And so that's what the can formal canonization process of the church does. And there's four steps to it. The first is servant of God, where they do a quick review and say, yeah, we should look into this person more. And that was opened on Father Peyton, and he got the title servant of God. Then they did a deep study on his life, everything he wrote, every speech he ever gave, and they looked at everything he did and produced, which was a lot. And about 6,000 pages went to the Vatican, and they said, yes, he had heroic, holy virtue, this man. So they dubbed him Venerable, and that was in 2017. And it got a ton of press. I loved it. And so there's two more stages. For the next one, for him to be beatified, we have to have a miracle attributed to him. It's, a, it's called a possible medical miracle. And so what that means is people contact us all the time, and they believe that they were miraculously healed of something by Father Peyton. But it has to be like no medical intervention. It has to be really clear, pure, that it's definitely a miracle. And so we have a couple in review, actually. So um, what will happen is if one is declared, medical uh, tribunals go over it and review it all. Um, so once that happens, he'll become blessed. And to become a saint, we need yet another miracle. So it's a, a very slow process because a lot of work goes into each step and you know, finding really miracles with no medical intervention. So when my mother was dying and we were praying in the hospital, that wouldn't work because she was getting all kinds of medical intervention. So these are, are really phenomenal. When you hear it's a miracle, it's a phenomenal miracle for it to go through the scrutiny of the, um, of the Vatican. So Father Peyton is in step two of four steps. Um, from, a, from a marketing perspective, I can't wait. I love this stuff. It's so great for PR and for the church and for all those holy people following. But it's a marketer's dream, let's face it. So you'll be seeing a lot of me when it happens and, and, and all that other stuff. So last question is, Rand and I uh, talked about the importance of planning. I'm sure you've done some planning that if Father Peyton is uh, declared a saint, how is that going to change the facility? Well, the interesting thing is um, the Vatican doesn't allow us to do any planning. Um, and so by that I mean we can never assume he's going to make it to the next step. So, so we can't do any planning. I can't re rewrite poets of books until the Vatican says so. And uh, they tell you probably about two weeks before they announce it to the public. So, but we're continuing his legacy no matter what. And that's what this is about, because Father Peyton wouldn't want this to be about him. I, I make it about him and leverage that, of course, but it's all about helping families pray, end of discussion. So we continue his legacy, and it will only be enhanced. And you can imagine if he becomes a saint what this place will look like. Oh, it'll be bigger. Oh, there'll be more restaurants. We just want to kind of manage it with the community so it, it doesn't become like those fringes of Disneyland. But um, for an American saint with Irish heritage, buried in the Boston area, yeah, again, marketer's dream. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Susan. It was really a pleasure to have you, and I'd like to give you this pen as a gratitude for your time and for hosting us. Thank you. And, and I hope you all find a few minutes to go through the museum. I hope you all come again, and, and make yourselves at home here, please. Thank you. Thank you.
are, which is I had to ask my sister, can you convert that? And uh, it was two pounds. Mm -hmm. And so uh, today he's a vibrant member of his, uh, where he works at uh, Milton Academy. Mm -hmm. And so there are blessings that probably do come true. And, and, and I have a 91-year-old uh, father and a 96-year-old mother-in-law. Both of them say the rosary each and every night. Uh, one recovered from a broken neck at the age of 90, the other a fractured hip, and uh, she shamed us because she was going to the gym twice a day. <laughs> she had a personal trainer and swam. And, but they, uh, I think that there's a testament that whether you say the rosary every night or whatever faith that you may participate in, the power of prayer um, is very, very helpful. Uh, my two family members, they take almost no medications, one pill. So I dare say, perhaps, uh, the power of prayer, saying the rosary, or some introspective reflection could give the pharmaceutical industry a run for their money, perhaps. So, uh, so maybe that might be one of the solutions. <clears throat> so at this point, I'd like to uh, introduce, basically, uh, well, introduce our next speaker uh, and keynote speaker, Don Wilson. Don earned his bachelor and master's degree from Bryant University. And he, he's a 20-plus year veteran of the ever-changing mortgage industry. He earned President's Club honors as a mortgage loan originator and sales manager at two different companies prior to becoming part of the founding team of Province Mortgage Associates in 2005. As Director of Corporate Relations, Don coaches mortgage professionals, delivers sales education, and helps to produce creative marketing and community outreach programs. Prior to his mortgage career, Don was a full-time musician playing acoustic guitar and singing all over New England to help fund his college education. In 2010, Don wrote and produced an album titled Sedated Echo, which helped to raise funding and created an awareness nationwide when his son Jacob was born with congenital heart disease, congenital heart disease. His life experiences and background inspired him to launch a new venture in 2018 titled Prospecting Intel. Pi, as you call it, uh, is about helping people embrace uncomfortable change to create better constants that produce new opportunities. His new sales brand also handed him the role, landed him the role of chapter educator for the fast-growing business networking organization, Network Networking Group USA, which helps business owners and other professionals build relationships that earn new clients by referral. Don lives by the simple credo that he's taught his three children for years. I try to make a stranger smile every day. Please welcome Don Wilson. Well, how was, uh, oh, oh, God, was that food good? Yes. I wasn't quite counting, I wasn't quite ready for French toast, but I could not walk past that. Um, just no way. So, um, one of my favorite, first of all, how many of you have seen me uh, present before? Right, so obviously they didn't get a celebrity. <laughs> uh, well, thank you to the two of you. Um, but I'd like to ask this question to start out. Uh, are any of you in the room have you grown up as only kids? No brothers and sisters? Oh, so Lexi, the person I've been dealing with for the last, only kids. So what do they say about us? You can say it. Go ahead. We can take it. Spoiled. Spoiled. Keep it coming. That's right. That's right. Thank you. You can stop now. So, uh, so do you agree, Lex? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know in my home. Yeah, right. I, I know with my mom and dad, you know, you kind of do get everything because there is no other little kid to give it to. You know, um, even my uncles, I, I know, didn't have children when I was, it was just little Donnie. But I know with my mom and dad, that didn't mean I got everything I wanted. You know, I got to high school, I had my eyes set on this $2,000 car, and my dad's like, well, I'll tell you what, your friend works at Dunkin' Donuts. I don't know how long they're going to be around, but why don't you go get a job? And uh, we'll talk about having a car. So they were really big on gratitude. Being grateful for what you have versus what you don't have. And any time that I have the opportunity to be in front of a group of adult humans, you're adults, right? Uh, and you're willing to, to listen to me for 25, 30 minutes 
Um, I really do appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you to the Chamber, to Chris, uh, to Lexi for all her help. And this amazing place, first time I've ever been here, I walk into that rotunda and completely moved. So thank you so much. Appreciate it. But I'm not done yet. I have stuff to talk about. So the presentation I'm doing is a truncated uh, presentation of something uh, that I was asked to create for Networking Group USA called, uh, well, I called it, Liquor and Coffee and Lunches. Oh, my. You know, let's talk about networking a little bit. But for, I'd love to get to know all of you, but we're going to do maybe a little bit of a speed round here. Um, so this is me, uh, very young. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure my mom had me singing You Light Up My Life by Debbie Boone. Anybody? <laughs> the other big one was um, I Write the Songs by Barry Manlow. And uh, I actually brought something. How many of you, uh, scream out, where were you born? Iran. Okay. <laughs> nice, you waited to just after this. Uh, Fall over Massachusetts for me, but I actually have something with me. Uh, from the day I was born, my grandmother purchased this at St. Anne's Hospital, the day I was born, and I got to know um, my friend, Mrs. Wallace here, and she happens to have the last, same last name as my best friend in the world, my buddy Matt. So you have a job for the next uh, 25 minutes or so. You have to take care of my whoopee. Is that okay? A whoopee? Sure. Well, you guys had one of these, right? Security blanket or a stuffed animal. He's got grandma's stitches in him. Take a look. Uh, God bless her soul. And uh, there are several stains, unidentified. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with uh, maple syrup. My grandma made me French toast on demand. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. So you, you heard I was a professional musician. You ready? Yes. <laughs> I know I'm at the placement stage for my hair, like, you know, um, but uh, that's actually coincidentally when I was in Jesus Christ Superstar, I was playing oh the role of Jesus and was one of the best experiences of my music career. That was the way I helped pay my mom and dad back for giving me the, the opportunity to, to go to Bryant. Um, so like they shared, I started this venture last year and I'm truly grateful that I, I I can still work at our mortgage company and have the opportunity to do other things out there. But I have to come up with a company name. And I knew I had to have this word in it. We're always searching for opportunities when we're in business. And not only for ourselves, but for the people we care about. It's not just a one-way street. It can't be just about me, right? And the second word that my wife actually came up with, I have to give uh, her credit for this one, is the word intel. You know, that knowledge that we acquire over time. But let's get something on the table. We agree we're all adult humans, kind of. What do most people do when they go to hear, whether it's Lil Don Wilson at uh, the museum or Tony Robbins, they get this intel, and what do they do when they leave? Not good. Not good. And I, I wanted it to be about people taking action. If I'm able to create, if I do my job right, and there's a, a little bit of an aha moment up here, I'd love for you to take action as you leave today. Is that fair? That's why I have this little action sheet at your table for the sections of my presentation. If I do a good job and there's something that, you know, you feel you can take action on, please do so and write it down. That's my dad. My dad still has like the pad and the three pens and he writes everything down. That's his database. Okay. The pi symbol, well I just happen to look at the P in the I and I'm like, isn't that that thing from high school? <laughs> what is that? And it's, it, and it's a mathematical constant. And as I've been coaching and doing sales education over the last several years of my life, it's really about habits. And, you know, getting uncomfortable to change something you know you need to improve and getting habits to happen. So that's why I said, I don't think anyone owns that thing. So I'm going to use that as my logo. All right? So, does anyone know who this is? Yes. Please tell me his name. Inigo Montoya. Very good. So, have, have any of you in the room not seen A Princess Bride? Oh my god, wait a second. Let me see. Do I have it with me? Let me see if I have it. I do. Shame. 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 And if you haven't seen Game of Thrones, I don't know what to say. But uh, The Princess Bride is this wonderful story from the 80s. Okay? And at the end, he says this line several times. So what I'm going to do first, if you don't mind, since this is about results-based networking, as I'd like to completely make fun of it first, okay? So, Inigo Montoya, he says at the end, he goes, hello, my name is Inigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepared to die. About 25 times, right? Well, he's networking, 
<laughs> Meaning, it's his polite greeting. Hello, my name. He, a relevant person, like you killed my father. Uh, managing expectations, prepared to die. Right. So what I need to start is I need three volunteers, and you have to have two things, somewhat of a sense of humor, and a business card. Do I have three people? First three hands to go up and you do get a prize. One, two, I saw the three of you right there, so we'll do it right there. I'll come to you, all right, no problem. So let's do, uh, please don't take offense, uh, my friends from the chamber, uh, but let's go to a business after hours because, I mean, you have to have a couple of drinks, <laughs> right? So here, you're gonna be my chamber, okay, stand up. We're gonna do a Seinfeld, we're gonna yada yada networking, okay? So, hi, how are you? Great, how about yourself? Um, Courtney. Yes. Don, how are you? Nice to meet you. So, how many of you have, I've had like five of these. These are so good. I do like even numbers, so I've had six. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, so, yada, yada, yada. Would you like to do business together? I'd love to. Okay, can I have your card? Absolutely. All right, cool. Scene, you may sit. <laughs> Okay, so we went to the chamber after hours, we networked, and then, you know, you go back to that home office of yours, and let's see, I know I have a coffee cup, here it is, you know, it's, it's can I, how awful is it that I found a coffee cup that says Dom with a star on it, and, uh, you know, it's on your desk, now that coffee cup's not used for coffee, it's used for business cards now, okay. you're in the cup. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, so next, um, well, you know what? I'll actually take the coffee cup with me. I'll take the uh, cup. Let's go to Panera. I mean, you have to go to Panera to network once in a while. Um, let's see, my, my friend right here, how are you? Cheryl. Cheryl, Don, how are you? You can stay seated. We're at Panera. Uh, <laughs> I mean, this could be the nicest Panera of all the Paneras. And they're beautiful, right? And I already have trouble stopping, you know, my mouth from, and I've had like five cups of coffee. And we've been here for two hours. I mean, you want to yada yada yada. Let's do some business together. Would you like that? I'd like that. May I have your business card, please? Absolutely. Oh, thank you so much. That's our scene. You're done. All right, so <laughs> I make it back home. The card goes into the coffee cup for cards. I need one more now. Uh, my dad got me into the, uh, the game of golf at a very, very young age. Um, that's why I went to Bryant University to play Division II. Obviously, I'm uh, not on the tour. I'm here. It's okay. But if you need a ringer for a tournament, please call. Um, so I got to have a golf hat. It's one of my favorites. Um, I got my putter. We're golfing. You and I, my friend. Great. Did you see anything? Rudes. Nice to meet you, sir. Ready? I told him. One more putt. Oh, my God. It's the last hole. Ready? Oh, yes. Cool. <laughs> All right, that was the best eight-hour round of golf I've ever played. I'm so glad I was there the first time you broke 120, but, um, you know, we've been together for eight hours. Let's do some business. Absolutely. Awesome, man. Thank you. And I got your card, too? Sure. Thank you very much. What about yours? Um, I don't believe in cards. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the purpose of this presentation. All right. All right. So, uh, so it goes in the cup. And I had some fun with things I've done myself many, many times, all three versions of that. But here's what starts to happen is, eventually, that coffee cup becomes this coffee cup. Have you ever seen this one? Yeah. You know, where cards kind of don't fit anymore. And this becomes my database and my follow-up and my contact management system. And yes, I did make that cup at Christmas time by myself. You know, take a look at it later. So, networking, right? So I want to share with you today, in these last few minutes, a couple of my ideas that I've observed in 22 years. And I'm not going to pretend that I'm some guru that I've done all of these perfectly for 22 years. I've made my own mistakes too, but I'd like to feel that I learned from some of them, okay? So here's the three sections. We're going to cover first what I feel is the networker's mindset. I feel there is one that is a mindset that yields results. The second thing is I'm going to give you some very specific ideas for what you can do before, during, and after, whether it's a one-on-one, -on -one, like my friend and I went to Panera, or a chamber after hours or a group event. And lastly, we're going to finish with a quick look in the mirror. There are no mirrors here, but we're still going to take a look in one. Ready? Are you ready? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Enough goofing around. All right, here we go. So section number one. All 
all of what I love to teach when it comes to sales education is what I feel is the difference between what is active prospecting activity versus more passive activity. I'm talking about swimming out to the boat, not waiting for it to slowly roll into shore when the tide and the wind are just right. Right? I did grow up in an industry where I was a straight commission employee and I didn't get leads from my company. I had to go get them myself and build them through relationships. So I feel that passive activity can be things like passing out business cards. You know, like, like Facebook and co-marketing each other. Now, I'd like to know that they're still important. I get that. But they can be a wait for it to happen type of thing where active is you attend events with a, a strategy and a purpose. Right? You make warm introductions immediately if possible, and you're able to refer business and earn the opportunity to ask for it as well. If your business is built by referral, please raise your hand. So asking for it is a pretty big deal. And we're going to come back to you about that later. All right? How's he doing? Is he okay? Fine. Behaving? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So define your intentions. Um, if you're in a networking group, or you take your networking group in general, right? Is it truly part of your business plan, or is it more extracurricular activity? That's what I mean. So, for example, what's the difference? Um, you show up, you're ready to go. You know, in our organization, we do 60-second commercials. Some people have called it elevator pitch for years. How many times do you observe the two-minute, 60-second presentation? Yes? Okay. You commit to one-on-ones, because I really feel that's where the business is done. You prospect for the people in your network, and you also are able to ask for business as well. Um, you ever have anyone join a networking organization and go, eh, I kind of really didn't get much out of it. Why do you think that is? How about someone from that table right there? Why do you think that is? They didn't put anything into it. You know, I was part of a BNI group years ago that really became that well-oiled machine. <clears throat> And people still came and went and said, I didn't get anything out of it. It's because they thought it was magical. You know, they thought it was one of these. I think I have one. They're not easy to get. Yeah, I do have a magic wand. I have it. <laughs> um, I just got to go, and I'm going to get the business or join. Okay, give it a shot. Take a second from taking photos. You don't want photos of me. Okay, just wave it. Did you get a referral for Matthew? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's broke. Uh, all right. Okay, what was that? Okay, so, was that the next slide? Yes. Okay, so here's one of those awkward questions. Are you obligated to refer the people in your group? No. Oh, I love that. I love getting different answers. I heard no's, I heard yeses. How about a yes? Why? Who said yes? We pass each other business, and we commit to making them good referrals. Awesome. Awesome. I heard a no over here. Why not? Uh, because some people don't share the same ethical standards, um, mm -hmm. though they share membership in the group. Yeah, <laughs> you know it's our, our, you know it's one of those things where if you earn it, you have the right to do it. <laughs> right? God bless you. Yes. The perfect place to sneeze. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going to start sneezing now. Um, yes, and you know that's why it really boils down to that individual relationship. Earning that opportunity. I went into a networking group that had a financial advisor. I've had my financial advisor for 20 years. He's got all my money. I probably should find out where he lives. <laughs> but it's pretty tough to just flip that to someone else. But I think it can be earned over time. And there also can be other ways to help each other out. How am I doing on, on time, Lex? Am I good so far? All right. Just throw something at me. So the end of the first section is this. Evaluate what the role of your networking activity plays in your business plan. When I create goals with the people I coach, I go, okay, so you want to do 60 units, whatever it is, transaction, depending on your line of work. And then I start going through their network. Okay, how much from these people? Okay, you got your networking, you got your past clients, and I add it all up and I go, uh, you got 42, you're missing 18. Where are those going to come from? Right? And if your networking activity is truly part of your business plan, you probably, especially if you're in a group, you should know what that group should pay you. You know, if you're going to invest time in a group, you really should have a tangible idea of what that represents to you. You know why? Because then your, network, your networking activity follows suit because you know what you expect to get from your networking activity. Does that make sense? Yes. 
Okay, I got nods. Let's move on. Okay. This is the before, during, after section. So professionals who value networking as part of their business plan, they, they prepare differently. They execute more productive meetings and they go to events a little bit differently, I feel. And they follow up meticulously to the point where people notice it. That's the game changer. Where they, you will come up in conversation in your circles and they go, oh, always on time, always ready to go, always referring good business, or not. Right? So, here's my before section. So if you're going to meet someone one-on-one, -on -one, we're going to take two scenarios. One-on-one -on -one with my friend from Panera, and in a group setting with my friend from the chamber after hours where we got hammered. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Don't do that, please. First of all, if I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet you at Panera, it's 2019. I can find out almost anything I want about anybody nowadays. It's kind of creepy. But I can find out on social media, on your website. I don't have to get there and go, so what was it that you do again? And we're starting there. I can do my homework. It does a lot. It also it saves time. Maybe you got someone like me you have to keep in control so we don't get off on tangents. Or maybe uh, it's going to just add a lot of credibility that you already took the time up front to do a little homework about the person you're in front of. I find that quite credible. Okay? How about in group events? Now, business after hours, right? How many of you have kids or grandkids? Okay. My 10-year-old's on that line of, Daddy, I don't want you to come and like, put me to bed and lay there for you know, a couple minutes now. It's close, right? Um, if I'm going to give that up, that time with him, and go to a business after hours, I better darn well know why I'm going. So, and I'm still about, I think you're getting to know me. I like to have fun. I'm going to go, I'm, I will have a couple drinks, but I'm going because it's worth my time. So, who's going to be there? What's my goal? Who do I want to add to my network? Are they even going to be in attendance? Can I find out in advance who's going to be there? And I'm even ready with my value proposition. How am I going to present myself when I have the opportunity? And how am I going to follow up? It's a different level than just showing up and going through the motions. Okay, here's a during piece. First of all, <laughs> don't throw up. You all just did. I probably shouldn't be saying this. You don't throw up on people when you're in a, you know, in a, in a setting of many, many, because that's just gross. Okay? <laughs> And that's Jimmy Fallon from his little show, Ew, it's so funny. Um, but you know what I mean. You know, he can monopolize people. You know, I got this guy in the corner, and we're having a good, and he's trying to get away, and I'm like keeping him play. You know, he's got other people to meet, too. So you're respectful of other people's time, but you're kind of prepared. You're ready to go with your value proposition anyway. Um, someone once shared this with me a long time, and it's very similar to my feelings. You know, someone asked you, so what's your business? What do you do for a living? And start with thank you. Thank you for asking. I really appreciate that. I just thought it was a great nugget to throw in there. But your value proposition, I think, is enormous. I do a lot of training for realtors. Um, I do a lot for the Rhode Island, Station, uh, Rhode Island Association of Realtors. I'm trying to do more with the state of Mass, too. But uh, I've had like 100 realtors in front of me. And it's, I had a lot of fun with it because I started to get to this part and I go, so why you? Why you? Why you? And you know, take a guess how many realtors licensed in the state of Rhode Island? Take a guess. 4,200. That's about half. So you got some competition in this little square, right? But they could not articulate why me. I feel you got to be ready with that. <laughs> Two or three words or phrases, why me versus everyone else that does what I do, and the same goes for your company. You should be ready to go with that stuff. And I have workshops just on that piece alone to build that so you have it and you're confident in it. But here's one of my favorites. I call it the next, uh, the car door factor. How many of you have those remote starters? Cool. Don't use those. <laughs> no, use them, especially in the winter. But this was my idea when I knew people I was coaching were going to events. I wanted to know how they did the next day. So how'd you do? Um, I had a pocket full of business cards. My offering to you on this topic is this. If you get to your car and you close the door, before you start it, just go, what do I have? If I've got a pocket full of cards, that's okay. But do I have any next steps with anyone at all? 
You know, you have that conversation, we had our little meeting, we met each other for the first time, we had a five minute chat, hit it off, had some things in common. I'd say, Joe, Joe. Joe. I'd say, Joe, how about this? Um, do you prefer texts or a quick call or an email? What, what do you prefer? Quick call. Quick call, me too. Um, Friday, I have some time around 10 a.m. May I put it in my calendar to give you a quick buzz and you can pick up where we left off tonight? Absolutely. Okay. Would you mind putting in yours too so you can expect it? And now I've got something. Now I've got a next step beyond just his card. Okay? Make sense? Yeah. All right. I don't know if I believe you. <laughs> so, one on one, I'm very big on using an agenda. I was taught this a long time ago by a mentor of ours of mine. It allows you to set expectations, manage time and gain control, not monopolize, just control. Uh, avoid unnecessary tangents with people like me, position yourself as the solution, and make your value proposition, and have some clear next steps. And also ask for business. I'm just going to lay this out. So this doesn't mean that um, I meet with Ray, and I slide the agenda across and go, this is what we're talking about today. I don't care what you want. It's nothing like that. First of all, genuine rapport. Humans helping humans, ladies and gentlemen. Take the time to, you know, anyone into self-defense, your guards up, you know, elbows together. Let the guard down, be somewhat vulnerable, share something about yourself, have some smiles, and at some point uh, there'll be an opportunity. And I'll go, Ray, here's what I'd like to chat about today. First, I'd like it to be all about you. I already did my homework prior to meeting you today, so I, I kind of know about you know, your career and some of your amazing achievements, but I want to know your business plan. What's important to you? What do you need that I can potentially help you with? And then when we feel we've, we've, you've had your shot and we're good, I'll take my turn and share what I have going on and how I'm trying to be successful through the, the <laughs> winter months, which I like to call the season of excuses, and, and getting ready for 2020. And why don't we just agree on some type of next step today? How does that sound? And I've, I've never had anyone yet in 22 years go, that sounds awful. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. It's almost like there's a sigh of relief, like, now we have a game plan as to what we're going to discuss. And they almost feel excited about it, because you know what? I don't have two hours for parent anymore. I got three kids. My wife and I both have pretty demanding careers. I got about 45 minutes. But you can accomplish a lot in 45 minutes. And don't forget to ask for business, because it's okay to do that, by the way. And after, whether you like social media or not, I got mixed feelings. It is going to be 2020. Friend someone on Facebook, link in with them. It's pretty simple. If you have a CRM, which is a system where you can stay in touch with your clients and network partners, um, don't let this become what your CRM is. Get them in there, OK? Um, please say thank you. If you said you were going to do something, do it. Make those introductions. And if it takes time, maybe I said I was going to make this wonderful introduction to Rockland. I get the perfect person for you. Now a few business days have gone by. I feel it's my obligation now to go, I just want you to know I've, I've made a couple of calls, haven't heard back. I just want you to know where things stand. So I didn't fall off the earth, right? But think about it. How often do we meet people, we go to events, we do one-on-ones, you feel like you got this chemistry going, and then it just kind of fizzles. This is how I was supposed to challenge you today. The difference between how I started out today with making fun of it. But you can see, if you truly commit to networking and it's really a part of your business plan, how many people you can actually create active referring relationships with, with activity that's more like this. And it's still fun, okay? The average American knows 600 people, did you know that? And you go like, I don't know 600 people. <laughs> you do, pick a friend, you go, oh, I know their parents. Oh, I know their brother and sister. And I met this friend through them. You, just how many of you have you spoken to recently? And the average Facebook user, 388 friends. It's a lot of people. But how many have you, I do prefer the phone to, had a nice conversation with you recently? What's happening in your life? All right. How can I help you? I believe you already know everyone you need to know who can introduce you to the people you want to know. We've just gotten to that. Um, 
that complacent type of social media world I feel, and this is just the opinions of Don Wilson, where we were waiting for it all the time. Because we're, we got all these mechanisms from hanging out our message to the universe, and then we wait. I want to have a conversation, find out what you need, tell you what I need, have some laughs, and help each other succeed. Now, I'm going to be 50 in March. I'm not excited about it. <laughs> All right? But I don't have time to wait anymore. I want to do business right now with people I care about and people I like. Okay. Some ideas. Blocking off time. I know for different professions that can be difficult. When I was at the peak of my mortgage career originating, Monday, 9 to noon, was my prospecting time. No one could get in the way of that. What's the worst thing that could have happened to my pipeline over the weekend? I always looked at my network and went, who can I give something to today that I haven't in a while? Who can I help? And I start making my calls. I'm making my birthday calls, transaction anniversary calls anyway. I'm not depending on my CRM to say happy birthday. Because they get that email and what do you get back in return? Thanks. That's not a conversation, right? Prospecting teams. People like, for example, the realtor, the mortgage person, right? They're, I coach guys that are prospecting realtors. I'm like, you ever sit down side by side and prospect with them? It'd be great to be side by side, make your calls. Say, so I'm actually sitting next to an amazingly talented realtor right now. Who do you care about that needs to buy, sell, or invest in real estate right now? Not only do I prospect in front of you, but you can give me real time feedback. Say it like this. But they're afraid to fail in someone they're trying to do business with, in front of someone, you know? It's a great idea, I, and not just because I said that, because I've seen it work. Okay. This is uh, one of my favorite things to do. This was kind of the inspiration um, behind what you're holding there. So, um, just quickly, sir, you ready? Yep. How many of you think I asked your name, sir? Bill. Bill, for referrals, ready? Bill, so nice to spend time with you today, sir. Same here. Just one more important thing, though. Here's my card. If you know of anyone that could use sales education, coaching, or maybe a public speaker for an event, would you mind passing it on to me? Sure. You're so kind, Bill. Thank you. And he did it already. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many of you feel I asked for referrals? I saw your hand first. Why do you feel that way, sir? Because you actually asked him to refer others to you. Yeah. Okay. And this is, I, this is no disrespect, okay, at all. But this has been something of mine for years where I go, this is what I heard. Here's my card, Bill. If you know of someone thousands of years from now that could possibly use my help, pass that on. If it's not all folded, wrinkled from being in your pocket that long. That's if I'm even still in this business, because you know what? Playing guitar in bars, bars was actually a lot of fun. Uh, do you see me say, do you hear Boz, the Massachusetts yeah, right. accent? It comes out once in a while. It's become the whoopee. The whoopee. That guy right there represents the things we know we need to change to improve. But we don't, because it's comfortable. Like that guy. You're going to have to give him back to me. Okay. <laughs> I have a new grandson. I okay. <laughs> That's the book I'm writing right now. I've been working all year on it. I'm trying to get it done by the time I turn 50 in March. It's called What's Your Whoopee? Your Uncomfortable Path to New Opportunities. And it comes from the movie Mr. Mom in 1980. Anyone? Okay. Because he sits little Kenny down. He's got his blanket. And he goes, Ken, you're going to be Kenny. Uh, Whoopee's not looking good, kid. Now, I, I know you little guys like your whoopies and all, but next thing you know, it's not enough. You're out on the streets, trying to score an electric blanket, and even a quilt. Next thing you know, you're strung out on bedspreads, kid. It's one of the most adorable father-son moments in movie history to me. And it's the whoopie, right? So, I want you to ask for business today. If you do one thing, just lose the word if in your networking activity, and go, who? Who do you care about that I could help for you today? Who do you care about? I have, I, he works for me and my personality profile. And for you means I really do believe in my heart and in my brain, motivation and mindset, which we didn't even talk about today, that I am your best option. Who can I help for you today? Okay? Lose the word if. If there's one thing you remember, get rid of it. It's the whoopee. So, <coughs> you don't only get me, though, when you ask for referrals. Paradigm, as it applies to networking, you get this army behind me. You get my network. So maybe what I do for a living right now is not helpful to you, but I have worked hard to build this world of people I know and trust of all kinds of professions 
that can help. What do you need? What can help me right now? Think like that when you ask for referrals in the networking context. Make sense? Excellent. All right. I've already got my five-minute warning. It's perfect for the end here. So there's the look in the mirror. So uh, this is the classic Stephen Covey. Anyone? Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective. So the first chapter of my book is called No Business. I have no business writing a book, I feel, because I don't even like to read. Seems wrong. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but that book I've read several times. Begin with the end in mind. What do you want to be known for? And I know for me, the word that I had learned quite a while ago was to be known as a rainmaker. A rainmaker. Someone who, those attributes that we shared before, you know, great attendance, prepared with 60 seconds that are fun, engaging others, assertive, <clears throat> not aggressive. There's a big difference. Assertive folks... As far as fundra fundraisers, very good at being assertive. They tell their story with passion, and they're very good at getting people to do what they need them to do, because it's all for the right reasons. Okay? Assertive is okay. Make qualified introductions. You know, I saw pe pe I watch people come and go, go, you know, they're, they're at their networking meeting, like, oh, I don't have a referral today. Uh, we have a hairdresser. Mom's got to need a haircut. Mm -hmm. Referral. Mom. Do you need a haircut? <laughs> you know, just because you want it to pat? No. If you really prospect for the people in your world, you will actively find opportunities for others. So you don't have to do that. Okay? And it's okay to ask yourself. And if you're a chapter of something, maybe it's your particular chamber, your networking group, Rotary, could be all kinds of things. What do you want to be known for? So when people come, are you fun, engaging, yet still professional? Maybe you don't wear jeans like I did today, and I wish I didn't. <laughs> our, our, dis, our, um, our washing machine broke this morning. And I went, oh yeah, 2003 we built this house. Yeah, this stuff's going to start to go now. <laughs> and next thing I know, I got ready kind of fast, and I just grabbed the jeans, and then not one person had jeans here. So I apologize. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean. Our networking group, actually this gentleman right here, John, you know, we, we all went to a food pantry last uh, um, holiday season as the group, not as our individual businesses. That was part of our identity, okay? So, uh, if you have any questions, now would be the time, but I would like to end the same way that I always start. From the bottom of my heart, you were very kind, very attentive. I'm so thrilled that you gave me the shot today. The only thing I have to do or my marketing kid gets very angry as I take selfies with ev every audience. But before that, I need my movie. <laughs> <laughs> You're bonding. Yeah, I know. A lot of people, but then I disinfect them so someone else can <laughs> bond. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. I'll, I'll do, should I do the selfie really quick? Yeah. Are you ready? We'll get as many of you guys in it as possible. Wait, that's a picture of me. Oh, wow. I've lost a lot of hair. You guys ready? Smile. Awesome, thank you. Hey, Don, don't sit down just yet. Maybe take, uh, keep your mic on. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm wired for so, sound. So Chris bought a gross of these one time, <laughs> about 10 times, maybe? Yeah. And so oh. we're going to give you this special oh, thank you. gift. Thank you but, so but Chris also penned something as a result of your workshop here. Okay. It is a business card. Yeah, I see. He was half listening, but, you know. Uh, I have room in the cup. Right. So right. could you read that out loud? The first thing is he wants you to manage expectations in this networking opportunity for you. Mm -hmm. What does it say? You're invited to Thanksgiving dinner in the Clooney home. In the Clooney <laughs> home. Yep, and managing your expectations, he wants you to bring what? Bring your apron. There you go. So, <laughs> so, I don't know if I own one. I don't know if I own one. Thank you. Appreciate it. Last time you'll give me your business. <laughs> So let's give a round of applause for Don. What a great motivation.
So, uh, Susan would like me to welcome you on behalf of the center here in the museum. Everyone's welcome to tour the museum after. And uh, I happen to go through it, and you're so right. Uh, what an experience it is. What a moving experience. So I'll be spending a little bit of time, and I, know, uh, and I hope that uh, some of you will be uh, doing it as well. Uh, some housekeeping matters and some announcements that we have uh, for future chamber events. Uh, join us for the business after hours on Thursday, November 7th at Rom, Dime, <coughs> Rom Jewelers and Diamonds, uh, located at Michael's Plaza in Brockton, uh, from 5 to 7. Uh, is this true, Chris, that they'll be giving away a diamond necklace? Yes. Wow. wow. So they're going to be giving away a diamond necklace. Uh, Christmas shopping starts early. Yeah, really. Uh, so on November 20th, uh, it's the 106th annual meeting and luncheon uh, and Business to Business Expo of the Chamber, and it will be at the Teen Challenge Multi-Purpose uh, Auditorium, as it was last year on Main Street in Brockton. The keynote speaker is the author and philanthropist Bill Cummings. He's a multi-billionaire, and the Chamber will secure uh, books uh, there uh, for you as well. Please try to reserve your seats. Uh, each year this event gets sold out, and uh, Chris and uh, Lexi and the staff hate to turn people away, but we have a limit of about 400 people, and uh, we exceed that just about every year. So please get, you know, get your reservation in early. The next Good Morning Metro South is Friday, uh, December 13th, at the Good Samaritan Medical Center in Brockton, and will feature Norm uh, Labatlet, uh, Improv Asylum and Launch Boston from 7 to 9.30 a.m. Friday the 13th, I know, so a little bit of laughter. <laughs> right and so some thank yous here, but first the announcement of the door prizes each month. Month we randomly select one company to be highlighted in our action report. This month, Patricia Kelleher from Family and Community Resources is the uh, person who will be featured in our uh, action report. So, congratulations. <laughs> so please see Emma before you leave uh, to, to make arrangements for your interview. Uh, and then today's door prize uh, is from Rockland Trust, is the Bluetooth speaker, and the winner is Irma Earth. Lermi, did I say that right? From Holiday Inn All right. Express. Thank you. <laughs> a special thank you today to our uh, ambassador team, uh, Rick Morgan Photography. Uh, today's uh, interviewer, Massa. Thank you very much, Massa. Today's sponsor, Rockland Trust Company. Our host, the Museum of Family Prayer. Our guest speaker, Don Wilson. Susan Wallace. And as always, Brockton Community Access, which always does a great job. Thanks to Mark Lindy and the staff for that. Please, uh, more, more selfies if you'd like, and please enjoy the museum. Thank you very much.